Thank you. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I'm glad to see a lot of faces again for the second part. My name is Doris Schierberg. I'm a lecturer in the Master of Information and Di Data Science um, program or MITS program at the School of Information at UC Berkeley. Um, this is the second year I get to organize this event with my wonderful colleagues from several corners of UC Berkeley. Working with them is a true pleasure. I'm excited to start the second tr track of our event today. The next two hours are all about the students at UC Berkeley. So we'll hear a keynote and then an hour long of lightning talks. This is a collaborative campus-wide effort, much like the field of data science. And I would like to thank you, our sponsors. Carly, can you switch to the next slide, please? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so we are working and get support from Research IT, Berkeley Lab, Institute for Data Science, um, Data Lab, Berkeley Information Technology, um, Berkeley Data Research Data Management, the School of Information, NERSC, um, Berkeley Computing Data Science and Society, RTL, and Berkeley Library. I hope I have not forgotten, forgotten anyone. Um, next slide, please. I would, of course, also like to thank my colleagues at Planning Committee. We come, as said before, from uh, many different roles across the campus, and I have yet to meet a team as efficient and productive as these women. So thank you to Alicia, Amy, Erin, Kelly Rowland, Lisa, and especially Srishti. Um, I have been uh, working with Srishti for a long time now, also in the Women in Myths program, if you ever join us there, we run some coffee meetups. Next slide, please. Um, also, another thanks to Carly and Emily for helping today. They were not on the slides, I'm sorry. Um, Wits has a code of conduct and uh, the WITS conference seeks to support all participants from across the world in an uh, inclusive, safe, and welcoming environment. All participants are expected to be considered, considerate, excuse me, respectful and collaborative and will refrain from demeaning discriminatory or harassing behavior and speech. We have anonymous reporting in place. Um, the URL that you see here, and we will also post that to the chat so that you can scroll back later. Um, okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> A few reminders, we are recording, so you can choose to switch all your cameras off or leave them on. Please stay muted while um, presentations are going. And if you have questions, post them in the chat. If we have time, we will gladly have a Q&A section after each part after and at the end of the lightning talks. Um, okay, so um, thank you, Carly. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our second keynote speaker for the day for the, to open the second track, Heron Lee. This keynote is very dear to me and very exciting. Herlong went through the MITS program and I got to work with her during one of my classes. Uh, last fall, she has won the HAL R Variant Award for her MITS capstone project that co conjoined machine learning and bioinformatics. Her exceptional performance as a student is not only re the reason we invited her as a keynote speaker. Herang stood out in our program as someone who created a community. She has been organizing learning groups, giving office hours around her areas of expertise, and being very vocal about the learning in MITS, helping students and teachers alike to improve. One of her slide decks is still circulating among the students. Um, I myself post that sometimes. These efforts resulted in another acknowledgement, the Outstanding Mentor Award from the UC Berkeley School of Information. Haerang, I'm so happy to have you today. Please take the mic. Thank you so much for that uh, generous introduction. Um, will you let me share my screen? Uh, in fact, I don't think I need the permission. I think I can go ahead. I already this. made you co-host. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, it is such an honor to be here today. And I'm glad that we have an intimate group so we can have a more personal um, and, and intimate conversation. Um, today, I will be talking to you about uh, the three strategies that will make you more effective for a separate. Um, my name again is Herang Lee, and how you pronounce it is like something you would say on a bad hair day when your hair does not look right, instead it looks wrong, hair wrong. Uh, it's Korean for together with the sun. Um, Many of you might be looking at me and wondering, oh, uh, this girl, you know, it's keynote speaker, but she looks really young. And actually, I'm going to guess I'm right there in the middle of the median age for this audience. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any way that I can be like more than, you know, five years older than the youngest of you, maybe 12. I don't know. I can't see everyone. I didn't ask you your age. I can only assume. Um, and then many people here in the audience have many more uh, years of experience than I do. Uh, point being, there's no way that I've got that many, you know, folds on my brain <laughs> to hold more information or that many more lines on my resume. So, I mean, sure, I just graduated from the nation's number one public university with a master's degree in data science, go Bears. But I bet a majority of you in the audience are in the same program or something similar from another respectable institution. So why should you listen to me? Well, it's because I've pulled up a couple of very interesting career stunts and I think you'll wanna hear how I did it. Here are some things that I've done that I really shouldn't have been able to, but I did. Uh, the first of which is a job family change. So previous to becoming a data scientist, I was an auditor um, specializing in fraud audits, fraud audits. Um, and I also at the same time changed my domain from managing corporate risk to developing products. Um, I've also won the Hal Varian Award with my team by doing a machine learning project in the field of bioinformatics when uh, really 90% of my knowledge in natural sciences comes from either my high school education or YouTube and National Geographic somewhere in there. So, I mean, these accomplishments are no Nobel by any means, but for a regular person to do, I am very proud of these achievements because these are no small feats. Getting the recognition in terms of awards, new jobs or promotions without the environment where I could build up um, enough relevant skills to do that, I think is pretty impressive, objectively speaking. <laughs> and I have a couple of tricks up my sleeve that I think everyone here will benefit from. And that's what I'm here to share. I'm going to spill it all, all my secrets and tips, um, how I make my every move count towards something and how I maximize the mileage of my efforts. Um, and the reason why I'm here to share with you is that the more of you smart young women I lift through this talk, uh, the better it is for this world. Um, a little bit of history, talking of world. <laughs> um, I was born in Korea, in Seoul, um, and I moved to New Zealand in Auckland, where I spent a couple of my clueless years, and I spent a majority of my formative years in India, in Mumbai and Bangalore, before coming over to California, um, where I am local today. Um, so I came here for undergrad actually, uh, and I attended UC Berkeley. I'm a Cal Bear with a double major in econ and business. Uh, my first job out of college was at a company called KPMG. Some of you might have heard it in the context of accounting because it's one of the big four companies in accounting. I wasn't an accountant, but I was in the consulting arm, risk managing consulting arm called Forensics. Uh, this team specialized in fraud investigations and legal consulting. So any analysis that an expert witness might do to produce uh, some an argument in, a in litigation. This is a team where I learned to analyze data through SQL, and I found that I had a knack for it. And um, I was actually getting a little bit dissatisfied here because um, in consulting, there were so many red tapes. Uh, and in the end, a consultant only got to see a very limited side of the greater problem that the clients wanted to solve. Um, so I was getting uh, pigeonholed and unsatisfied, and I wanted to do more. And I wanted to do more, uh, deal with more complex data and grow in analytics. So I switched over to a new company, um, a small company called Uber, <laughs> bigger now, but it was kind of smallish back then. And uh, this was a really good move. Oh, I forgot to explain. So uh, on the x-axis is a timeline going from past to future. And then on the y-axis is my uh, career fulfillment. So you can see like college was so much fun. And then um, 
when I get the first job, it just, I mean, nothing will ever be as fulfilling and fun as college. So I ranked it a little bit low. And as my um, fulfillment was tanking over time, I made a, a job switch to uh, find more fulfillment. And this was really great because I got to touch a lot more diverse data, ranging from the finance data that I was used to, um, all the way to like trips and Uber Eats. And it was really cool. Um, but in the end, I still felt like um, the field was limiting in the sense that um, it was still risk, meaning it was all about uh, retrospective analysis to see what went wrong in the past. And then when we talked about the future, it was in terms of what shall we not do, what shall we prevent, and less about what risks should we take to push the boundaries. Um, so I was starting to feel uh, less and less satisfied in the job, um, which pushed me to pursue a part-time master's degree program at UC Berkeley. And this is a MIDS program, the Master of Information and Data Science program um, at UC Berkeley. So at this point in my career, um, work was whatever, it was paying the bills. <laughs> um, and I mean, I had a relatively strong career track there, but I kind of realized this is not where I actually want to go. And I found fulfillment outside of work in the in the academics. Um, and it was just so much fun. I had a big uh, technical skill gap to fill and um, coming in with very blank state of statistic knowledge and coding knowledge to be able to build on it and to see myself grow was really, really fun. And in the middle of a program, I could leverage what I learned to um, score an internal transfer within Uber. And I went into a data science team as a product analyst. Um, and this was in Uber Transit where I got to be part of the product team um, telling the engineers, hey, this is user behavior, let's build this and that. And I had so much fun. Um, and shortly after, I got a new job at Meta, formerly known as Facebook, also as a data scientist um, slash product analyst. Um, this was um, a really great move for me because I also got a promotion in the process. And then since then, I have graduated from the MIDS program and I'm currently trying to enjoy life, take a break and also pay attention to other people, uh, lifting other people's careers through opportunities like this. So same graph, a little bit of a different angle. Um, the first box on the left is more on the business side of things, um, risk, business, all of that, um, even though it had a little bit of a uh, touch of analytics. And on the right hand side is the data science. Um, having to, uh, so this was, a, this was a really big jump for me and it was not easy. Um, so yeah, finance icon and uh, data science. So when I started the data science program, um, having to juggle a part-time grad school while working full-time and like ramping up on a technical discipline in order to make a career pivot, all of it on top of each other, it was pretty hard, um, but I did it. And I, in this process, I even had an opportunity to jump into bioinformatics, which I'm really proud of. And then the next move was also hard. So even though I had experience, um, well, academic foundation, um, Getting a non-entry role, so this was a mid-level DS role, um, was not easy, um, but I managed. And then getting a promotion within a year um, while going into a bigger company um, was also uh, not the easiest thing. So you can see like on the right-hand side, I'm jumping from one hard thing to another. And the span of this timeline is like only two to three years. Three, if you include the beginning of my uh, master's degree, but really two, if you just count the career jumps. So um, I don't think this would have been easy if I completely relied on my personal efforts. And um, I want to talk to you today about being more resourceful and going beyond that personal effort. So this is the mental image that I have um, uh, of the elements that are within your control or under your influence. So uh, personal effort is like what you think it is, uh, you know, what, what you can personally do and learn and grow. Um, but uh, there's also the element of network and brand. So um, yeah, let me go into the network first. So this 
is the people that you know or the communities that you're a part of. This includes the people in your home ground who share the interests with you or values with you. These are the, your colleagues, peers, mentors, a community like women in data science, um, and it could be a number of other things. If you manage the network well, then you have an easy access to information, opportunities, talent in case you're hiring, and other resources. The third element here is brand, and this is what you're known for. It's your reputation that precedes you within your network and outside of your network, like how the public perceives you. If you manage your brand well, that brand gives you credibility and influence right off the bat. So you don't have to put in as much personal effort into proving yourself and convincing people that you can do it. So um, I'm going to talk to you about how you don't have to do everything yourself, but by redirecting some of your personal effort into branding and networking, um, you can make your network and brand work for you in achieving your goals. In a theory, let's get into story time. I was promised a captive audience <laughs> and I love telling stories and uh, let's get right to it. So the first story I'm going to tell you about um, how I jumped into the deep end of bioinformatics and machine learning to produce an impactful data science project uh, on how my team and I clustered protein structures with no background in biology or natural sciences. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, this is about the capstone project, which is the last graduation requirement in the MITS program at Berkeley. This project is a combination of everything that you've learned in the program, the core skills and concepts, and you're supposed to apply it to solve a real world problem. It can be in any field or any topic, but it has to be a real end to end data science project. My team and I found an opportunity where data science could add value to natural sciences with relatively low lift, thanks to what was an incredibly opportune time. And that was to cluster 3D protein structures. Um, as an analogy, a few years ago, uh, DNA sequencing, when that first came about, it provided the world with a brand new type of data at scale that changed the shape of history. Um, it changed the field of medicine, evolution, and criminology. Now, the next big thing in the science world, in the next big data, was a 3D structure of uh, proteins. Um, it, 3D structures were typically obtained in labs through what's called X-ray crystallography, and it would take weeks to months to obtain the 3D structures of one protein. So it was just not scalable. We had the data, but in a very limited scale, which changed a couple of years ago when Google DeepMind introduced a model called AlphaFold2. And this ML model could predict the 3D structures at scale with high fidelity. So now the world just got this gift, this mountain of data that it could do anything with. So just like how DNA changed the face of many disciplines, this is the next data set that would do it. And it was just released in July, 2021. And my team and I heard the news and thought, hmm, well, it's the next big thing and no one's touched it yet. So could we make it any easier to navigate through this brand new mountain of data by clustering them? So think like 3D image clustering based on similarities, except instead of images we're using with uh, protein structures. Um, and the similarities are about how similarly are those protein shapes um, to each other, uh, how, how similarly they are shaped to each other. Um, the problem with clustering is that it's an unsupervised learning problem. So there is no right way to do this. There is no right answer. It's not like, oh, is this a hot dog or not? It's like, hmm, well, we cluster some things together. How do we know these are the right things to group together? And the data that we're dealing with were extremely complex, which meant we needed scientific evaluation metrics to guide this entire project. And none of us had any kind of scientific expertise to comment on what the right metrics were because see, I came from uh, fraud and audit. Um, my teammate, Dani, came from also audit background, but and like ethics and compliance, even though he was a really good um, data science leader. Um, and then Linda was a product manager specializing in foreign exchange. And Skylar, he had some public health related degree back in undergrad, but um, now he was an engineer in a tech company. So we really, really needed a subject matter expert or two or 10 to come in and help. So I started to reach out. Um, at first I started searching among my friends. Um, 
you work at a pharma company, can you comment on this? So some friends were interested, but they also didn't have the deep enough expertise because it's a very specific discipline where science meets machine learning. Um, so uh, yeah, it was pretty difficult to find somebody within my immediate network who could help. Um, I've met my friend's boyfriend for the first time, found out he was a scientist and ended up asking him, hey, uh, I'm working on this interesting project. Do you think you could comment on it? And he was really helpful, but again, he was only um, tangentially related. It was bioengineering, so more related than any of the other friends, but it wasn't, it wasn't the heart of the matter. So I went outside of my network and I put in some keywords on Google and LinkedIn, like protein researcher, and sent some cold emails. I think I sent like dozens of them. Um, and in the email, I introduced a team, provide some contacts and ask them, would you be able to make 30 minutes, an hour, maybe three hours over the next four months? I was very specific about um, how they could add value to my life and how much I would appreciate it. A very renowned professor sent me a very curt, I'm too busy for this email, which is fine. Um, and I was kind of getting discouraged because most of them went unanswered. But suddenly um, a couple of total strangers started responding and they were like, sure, this sounds super interesting, let's chat. And these were people who were like PhD candidates and postdoc researchers in the field of protein research or protein design from UC Davis to University of Washington to like private industries. So in the end, I got about 10 people on the call, many of whom were willing to meet more than once. Um, and one of them said, yeah, when I got your message, I knew it was way too specific to be a scam. And it was a topic that changed my career as a scientist. So I wanted to talk to you. And that made him want to spare his time. So anyway, from these uh, helpful strangers, we got some pointers to the relevant scientific research papers. Uh, we learned about the metrics that were being used in the field of um, uh, protein research and design. And that allowed us to come up with a set of sensible scientific eval metrics to uh, look at our clustering problem. And we were so excited when we started to see the similarities of the proteins in each cluster. Um, and we couldn't have done this without these kind strangers help. So that's my strategy number one for you. Um, if you don't know how to solve a problem, ask for help. Help can be found in many shapes and forms. Sometimes it's a tutorial somebody made public on the web. Other times it's a full on like 60 minute one on one conversation with an expert. Um, so you can you can be open minded about what kind of help would be you know, useful to you. Um, one thing I would notice that time is a very valuable resource. And if you're going to ask for someone's time, be very conscious of the value of it. Um, so like make sure you do some independent work first and show that by talking and getting gaining time from this person, um, you would gain significant value. Um, and also be thoughtful about the questions that you ask. Don't ask generic questions. Sometimes I get very generic questions from like undergraduate students who wanna know about on-campus recruiting. And I'm like, girl, it's been a decade. I don't remember. Um, search your school website. <laughs> um, but if you ask me, how was your experience balancing a new job while taking classes? Then, yeah, I've, I've done that. I'm probably one of the few people in the world who have done that. So I am willing to give you very personal and deep insights and it's worth my time and it's worth yours too. So um, what, do you, what do you get in return for asking for help? Well, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. That's the thing, you can leverage other people's wisdom to effectively achieve your goals. And this works because there's a selection bias. You see the people that respond, those are the people who are more helpful, who are kinder and more expert in this field and ha have, have something to say. So um, that's why this is a very effective strategy for expanding your network and, um, and uh, putting the right people into your network. Um, so how do you go about it? Well, you can start with the acquaintances or you could make very targeted cold calls to strangers asking specific questions. Um, this is a mental image that I have about asking for help, right? So uh, reach out. Um, this is like, great. It, it, this can be inside your network or, or outside, but the reach out, you can cast wide but targeted nets. Some of them will respond, others might not. Get them on a call and that initial consultation just might be enough. 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, and that might be the end of it. But maybe you find some follow-up items and you want to have another conversation later. Um, and that also, this is, what, this is um, if you wanted, could be the end of your relationship too. 
but how to really like push it over the edge and take it to the next level is that you should follow up after you got everything that you needed. Take the initiative to keep them informed of the thing that you asked for the help with, like, um, uh, and and then. Um, by doing that and showing appreciation and like checking in when the opportunity, uh, when the time looks right on an ongoing basis means that you have an end to building a lasting relationship. Um, I have another story about this. So my capstone teammate, Danny and I actually go way back before the MITS program, um, we, we knew each other already. And that's because I had cold called him to ask about um, like, how do we elevate the data capabilities of an audit team? Again, a very specific question that not many other people can answer but Danny. And Danny being a very helpful and knowledgeable person that he is responded. Afterward, we kept in touch um, and eventually ended up in the same grad school program. And when the time for Capstone came around, we knew we wanted to work with each other and look at the team that it built. So that's my first story. Um, second story, uh, this one is about how I got a new product data science job and a promotion with no prior product experience or DS experience. So to clarify, my roles uh, leading up to my first DS job had an element of analytics, but the kinds of questions were pretty limited. They were often yes or no questions. Was there a violation of a law or a contract? Um, was there a fraud of a concerning level? Yes or no? Um, and it was less about like, what else What else should we do? I mean, there, you could make it to be like that, but it was really hard. Um, but anyway, um, I was starting to be very thirsty for more. And especially after a year in grad school, I was finding my current role in internal audit thoroughly unsatisfying. Um, at that time, I was leading the analytics team in the internal audit department at Uber, um, and the rest of the team were mostly like auditors and legal compliance professionals, and only a couple of us that were data professionals. Um, thinking back, it seems like a child's play <laughs> compared to what I do now. But anyway, um, and like I've, I've been doing my best there and trying to make the most of it. Like I try to elevate the analytics capabilities of the team, uh, create a data culture. And I've been trying for a couple of years. Um, I created a, an analytics training program from scratch. I taught my colleagues how to form hypotheses, how to explore data, um, how to like use data to look at risk. But um, I realized that I just, I, I couldn't be happy spending 100% of my time elevating other people and the department because I wanted to grow. I wanted to be a better data scientist or an analyst. And um, it was really difficult knowing that there was nobody in the team who could mentor me or help me grow. And that's when I knew that I had outgrown my team and what my, um, my goals were not aligned with what this team could offer and it could never be not in not in a couple of years not in the timeline that i was um, that i wanted um so i decided to switch jobs um i was a year into the grad school program and uh because i had made such fast improvements in data science and statistics and coding i was very confident that i would be able to find a new job soon um let's say the reality wasn't so rosy so when I started looking into data science jobs, ranging from product analytics or machine learning to statistical modeling, I quickly found out that on top of the technical foundation, uh, the jobs required a practical application experience in a relevant field. And I think if I wasn't trying to do this diagonal thing, so if I was at least a data scientist already, or I was at least in the domain of product already, this might've been easier, but pivoting on both fronts was so difficult and I kept asking myself, how was I supposed to get any relevant experience if nobody would hire me in the relevant fields? And personal effort, uh, this personal effort wise, I was already pouring every drop of blood, sweat and tears into making myself more hireable as a data scientist. I polished my resume, I've been coding, I've been like practicing, um, but some things were just outside of my control. like being in the right role or domain to have the experience that was, I, I couldn't get that. Um, 
just through my F word or convincing a recruiter that like you should get me an interview based on my potential alone. But no, they want somebody who can hit the ground running. And it's true that I didn't have enough evidence to convince the hiring manager. So um, it, was, it was pretty difficult to make that pivot. Um, thankfully, I had other resources like my network because I had been building my network in the DS community for some time now. And I would say that's eventually what helped me succeed in pivoting my career. Networking actually has been one of the highest priorities in my career so far. I learned very well during my business undergrad days and very well during my consulting days. And so when I entered the School of Information, um, I, I, I could already foresee these challenges um, of pivoting. So I decided to make networking in this uh, school community one of the top priorities at school. So one thing I did every semester was organizing and running study groups. Um, it's way easier than it sounds because you just like pick a time that works for you and um, create a Zoom link and post it on a Slack channel and people will show up. Um, sometimes it's 20 people, sometimes it's two, but whoever it is, those are the people who are like interested in learning more, discussing more, and also like willing to socialize a little bit. Um, and also because I called a meeting, it was up to me to determine the agenda, topic, and pace. So I was in control. Um, it was also a really good way for everybody to get to know me, even the silent ones with their cameras off. I might not notice them, but they would notice me. Um, and they would be able to witness all of my like organizational communication skills. So it's a great way to advertise myself and um, get to know folks. Um, and, and, you know, it was a, it was a really um, easy way to do that. So that's one thing I did. Another thing that I did was, well, I can't organize things all the time, but if somebody else did, I would show up and I'd try to connect with the folks there. Um, so one time I got invited to speak on a panel to um, UC Berkeley undergrads about, uh, about the MITS program. So I showed up, had a great time and walked away, but not before talking to all of the other, other panelists and some of the iSchool staff for a little bit and adding them all on my LinkedIn. So I've been like building this up and going back to my job search story. Um, one of those panelists that I met like a long time ago um, was a director of analytics at a tech company. And I had added her, her at LinkedIn on LinkedIn that day. And one day I saw that she posted, she was hiring. So I reached out, she interviewed me. She thought I might be a good candidate um, and put me through the hiring process. I eventually did not get the job because of cross-functional interviewers from like product and engineering. Um, they didn't see enough evidence in my past experience that I would be able to um, serve as a very reliable strate strategic partner. Well, at least not immediately. And they needed someone who could hit the ground running. So I didn't get the job, but um, the hiring manager, because we had this relationship, she was more open about me giving uh, open about giving me lots of helpful feedback, and she also advocated for me in the hiring process as much as she could because she knew uh, my growth journey. She was familiar with the with the MITS program. So after I got the news, I sent her a thank you message, and then she responded by giving me very practical tips on how to answer some of the um, difficult questions that I didn't do well on. I used that feedback to improve myself as a candidate, and I applied to more jobs. And eventually, that's what got me an internal transfer into the Uber Transit's uh, data science team. Um, my friends from the study group, they also have been so helpful in telling me about job opportunities or being willing to refer me. And a friend at Meta put in a referral for me, sent me all the helpful public information that she used when she interviewed for the role, like the tutorials and um, other resources. And she also made me feel very safe in like asking her all the dumb questions that I had. And so even though I didn't get a job at Facebook then that summer, a year later, I leveraged the same friends, um, same referral and the same resources to score a job at Facebook. And this time I got a promotion to a role that would be equivalent to a senior data scientist at Uber. So I don't think I could have done that without this friend's help. So you see, like if I hadn't had all these layers of work over the years, um, you see how much harder it would have been. So that's my second strategy for you. Position yourself in the center. So the first strategy was about finding help, but like you can't, making cold calls, identifying resources, it's too much time and effort and it feels like you're an outsider trying to find an in, it's exhausting and time consuming. 
sometimes you just can't do that. So instead of trying to break into those like new, new communities or relationships, um, make it come to you. Find out where people gather or are likely to come and stand in the center of that room and um, enjoy that foot traffic, let them come to you. Like I said, a study group attracted some of the most motivated students who were willing to socialize. And I could also like show them what I got because they had to see me and they had to listen to me. Um, and when I got invited to the panel events with other like interesting panelists or very motivated undergraduate students, I'd go and I'd try to make connections there. So use this strategy to build a network fast and in the fields of your interest. Um, if there's an opportunity, you'll hear it early because now you have this network. Or if you have an opportunity, it's very easy to reach other people's ears um, in, the, in the pool of people who share an interest. And this works because um, by increasing your visibility, you're gonna be on top of somebody's mind. And my friend from study group, she's the one who reached out to me and said, hey, I wanna refer you, I think you'll be good for this job, are you interested? So if they have something useful, uh, like in my case, they'll call you. Uh, this is also a really great way to demonstrate the qualities you want to be known by. So this is tying into the brand element, like leadership or technical expertise or whatever it is. Um, how do you do this? The easiest way is to sign up for an easy position that increases a face time with other people. It could be like volunteering at a social, uh, sorry, professional event or something as simple as like signing up for a social committee at work. Um, a quick tip here. Don't think strictly professional. Do some fun things like music, book club, sports. This allows you to meet people in their natural element, and it'll be so much more worth your time. I've pursued a lot of things just because it made me happy, like volunteering to mentor high school students um, or like starting a community within the School of Information for people who love Korean culture. And I can call the members of these communities a part of my network now, and they come to me. Um, this last story is about how I turned my innate desire <laughs> to help people into a powerful force that multiplied my influence. It's about how I get highly motivated data scientists to call me and solicit my advice or my help. Every once in a while, I get a message from a stranger um, and or sometimes a distant, distant acquaintance, and they're usually looking for a perspective on the data science career, the companies I worked at or the industry, or they have a job they think I might be a good fit for and they wanna know if I wanna apply. So I'm not like, you know, famous by any means. I was never on TV or anything. So how do they know that I am worth their time and I'm worth reaching out to? It's because they've read what I've written um, I've written about grad school, data science career, interview preps. In fact, I write a lot. So those are the topics that I write about most publicly. But at work, I write about my analyses and I opine on the products we should build next. And personally, I write letters. I write book reviews, um, sketch comedy. Like one day I will get to writing a sci-fi novel. <laughs> so I love writing and I love um, uh, putting what I know or what I think out there. A portion of the people who read what I write will find it interesting. And a portion of those people think they will, uh, they will talk to me, that they should talk to me and ask me questions, hear my thoughts and work with me. One of such people became an incredibly high value add to my life when I was least expecting it. Um, so this is about when I got a virtual knock at the door from my capstone teammate, Skylar. He's a very talented machine learning engineer he reached out to say, I want to team up with you for the Capstone project. And I recruited him into my team on the spot. Um, he said he came across a, a, an article that I posted um, on, on the iSchool Slack, actually. And he said, that spoke to your work ethic and ability, and I want to work with you. First of all, I was very pleased about his comments on my work ethic and ability. And second of all, I was in need of one more member to add to the Capstone team. Um, I had already um, started talking to Dani and Linda at this point. And Dani being an excellent data science leader and Linda being PM, I had put an engineer on my wish list. Now scanning my classmates to say, hmm, like which one of these people will be an engineer and also um, be like really pleasant to work with. So um, 
when Skylar reached out, he's like, hey, I have data engineering and machine learning experience. And he was like, I'm willing to put in the work and collaborate with you. I was like, you sound responsible. And that's really all you can ask in a good teammate. So I immediately introduced him to my two other friends. And that's how our Capstone team came to be. The reason why Skylar got in touch with me was that he read an article that I wrote about my career pivot. When I wrote that article, my primary objective was to provide the current and future students at a part-time uh, master's program, just like MIDS, with some practical tips on how to maintain a work-life balance and find a, um, a professional or academic success. But I also knew, so that was my primary objective was to help people, um, but I also knew that this would help me and I wanted this to be a branding exercise too. So I was very careful when I, uh, how I crafted the message and portraying myself. Um, and Skylar um, read the article, he heard my authentic voice come through plus the message, the marketing message that I had, um, that I had hidden in there. Um, and he was like, I am so that you have a great work ethic and abilities and I'm gonna get in touch with you. Um, in the end, Skylar made an instrumental contribution in parsing through some of the most uh, technically challenging aspects of our project, including like leveraging the latest 3D um, image classification technology and, and intertwining it with our protein data to come up with a brand new embedding. Um, I don't think I could have done that myself. So I'm really glad I knew somebody who could do it and he has come to me um, before I reached out to him. So. Yeah, Skylar is just one of the many people who get in touch with me because of the contents that I share. Um, there are many people who bring less um, immediate or obvious value to my life today. And these are the people who are mostly asking me for my health or perspective. But I know that many of them are going to be valuable connections for me in the future. So even if they are a little bit lost on something right now, um, I am down to invest my time in them today, um, notwithstanding other life priorities. Um, so yeah, that leads to my strategy number three. Share your knowledge. This can be in um, uh, any form, articles, tutorials, research papers, videos, live classes, workshops. Sharing your knowledge is about building your influence. Your brand now has evidence to point to, which is your history of sharing your expertise. And in, uh, these will all add up to elevate your brand and credibility and influence. Um, try to share something that really interests you, like. I will never write an article on internal audit, even though I have expertise in it, because that's not what I want to be known by. Um, that, is, uh, that is an industry or um, field that I tried hard to get away from. So even though just because you're good at something doesn't mean you have to be known for that. But if it's about like something fun, like how do you elevate your career? Um, yeah, I am down to um, share that knowledge. So why does this work? Well, remember how back in the day, like 12 slides ago, <laughs> you had to go out and find people and you had to solicit help. And like more recently, six slides ago, you had to find a foci of talented individuals and like try to insert yourself in the future. Um, now by sharing your knowledge, you become that focal point and the magnet that attracts people who want to know what you think. Um, at an advanced stage, I imagine entire communities may form around you. Um, there are plenty of opportunities to share knowledge. Um, you can start small uh, by coaching or teaching small groups of people, wherever you feel comfortable. Um, this might be at work or at school or something else on a volunteer basis. Um, and you can leverage different forms of communication like blog tutorials, videos, um, the point is you should choose what you want to be known for and start building a track record of um, speaking like an expert on this on the matter. Um, in case you are curious, here are some things that I personally aim for when I think about my brand and when I share content. Um, when I share things at work, I'm trying to build trust. I want my PMs and designers and engineers to um, rely on me and think, yeah, I'm going to listen to this data scientist because what she has to say is insightful and reliable. 
Um, in other professional settings, I want to be known as an empathetic mentor in the field of technology. Um, and personally, I just love being a storyteller. So when I create personal contents, uh, it's mostly based on storytelling and having fun. Um, so for full transparency, I hope that I have achieved these brand objectives with you today during this talk. And to recap, here are the three strategies I shared with you um, for becoming more effective for less effort. Number one, ask for help. Number two, position yourself in the center. And number three, share your knowledge. And all of this is about building your network and reputation, which makes a little bit of personal effort go a long way. And in closing, remember, Rome was not built in a day. Even though I sold today's takeaway as, uh, you know, like getting way more bang for your buck, it's not really about working less. It's about increasing the outcome of like every um, output of every unit of effort that you put in. So keep putting effort toward your goals, um, but work smart, not hard. Um, and make sure you're playing the long game by investing time in your network and your brands. And the world will be your oyster. That's a wrap. Special thanks to all the people who made and released these awesome resources for free. And please follow me on Medium, where I plan to write more, or LinkedIn for more contents on career and data science, or send me really good questions by email. <laughs> I'm on vacation, so I might be a little bit slow, but if it's really good, I will be, I will be tempted to answer. Um, so I'm very excited for this next and final part of this first day of the WIDS programming, of WIDS Berkeley programming. Um, so I'm Erin Foster. I'm the service lead for the research data management program here at Berkeley, which is a partnership between the library and uh, research IT here at Berkeley. So we work closely in the RDM program with researchers and other units on campus around data management strategies and other critical aspects of working with research data in particular. So for the next hour or so, um, we will hear nine presentations on data science research projects that have been completed by Berkeley students. So these are lightning talks. Um, they're gonna be five minutes each and we will hold questions until the end. So after all the presentations are done, so we can make sure that we get through everyone. Um, so please though, feel free to add um, questions in the chat as we go and, and or make sure to note, you know, which presentation you would like to ask questions about so that you're prepared for that. And um, I will say that the first portion of these lightning talks will be presented live by some of the speakers. And then we have a couple that have been pre-recorded that I will play at the end. Um, so I guess without further ado, um, I will hand it off to our first presenter, um, Yashwin Huang, um, to kick us off. So Doris, if you could please. Yeah, okay. Can you see my screen now? It looks great. Okay. Mm, hello, everyone. I'm Yashun, and I'm a first year PhD student from Statistic Department. Today, I will talk about my work on the evaluation of clinical decision rules under PCS framework. Um, and this is a joint work with Will and Yishun, also from our department. First, what is PCS in the title? PCS is short for predictability computability and stability. Prof. Bing Yu proposed this framework for veridical data science. The most important concept here is stability. The stability not only includes statistic uncertainty consideration like traditional applied statistics, but also assess how human judgment call may impact the result. And usually when we do modeling, we're only considering the modeling part in the data science. However, the PCS framework stress predictability, computability, and stability in every step of the data science life cycle. Faithfully applied PCS framework will give us more reliable and responsible results in real data problem. For example, in this program about the CSI in children. So first, so cer cervical spline injury define injury in this part. It is close to the head and may damage the nervous system. The standard diagnostic tools for adult is CT scan. But because children are much more sensitive to the radiation, we want to reduce unnecessary CT scans for children. Therefore, 
our goal is finding interpretable and easy to use decision rules for emergency department doctors whether a CT scan is needed. The data we use, many was originally collected for a previous research. They used the medical result, applied logistic regression, and proposed a final decision rules for doctors with a pretty good sensitivity report. However, if we go deeper into their paper, there are vital problems. First, how they claim their data is not clear. For example, how they deal with data, how they deal with observations with missing. In fact, I implement their paper and I cannot get such high sensitivity. And second, the biggest problem here is that they only report training set evaluation without out sample testing, which will heavily shaking the reliability of their model. If we follow the PCS framework, things will improve. But because of the time limitation, I won't go through the modeling details, but there are three main points here I want to stress. First, we randomly split all the data into training set and a validation set before any analysis and keep one part untouched until the final evaluation. Second, during modeling part, we propose a special but simple train structure based on domain knowledge for this special problem, not just use general models, which are supposed to be good in other cases. And the third, the most important, the stability check, that is shaking our human belief at the data set, including the researcher's judgment cost as we documented when we do data cleaning part, and also the data perturbation. And here is part of the result of the stability check. We tried perturbations on our missing data imputation, choice of thresholdings, and, and many other documented judgment call. The plot here shows the sensitivity and specificity are pretty, are pretty stable under the shaking. So though we don't have such beautiful sensitivity in the original paper, we believe our methods are more reliable and responsible and can really help with clinical decision making. However, the original paper, although they have good results, but there is question mark in the predictability and stability of their model. So briefly summary, the, this evaluation and application shows how applied statistical model can be fragile. And we should be more responsible, reliable, and transparent about our results. And applying the PCS framework is a powerful tool for us to reach this goal. Yeah, that is, that's it, thank you, yeah. Um, so um, uh, my, I'm Saptarshi, I'm a secondary PhD student at uh, the Status Department in Berkeley. And today I'm going to present my paper on uh, detecting meaningful clusters in high dimensional data, a strongly consistent sparse center-based clustering approach. So this is joint work with my collaborator and advisor, Dr. Swagatun Das, and is published at the IEEE TPAMI. So um, let us begin with um, the question, what is clustering? So we all know that uh, clustering is um, the task of finding um, groups in the data based on the similarities. So we want to group our unlabeled data set in such a way that points which are more or less similar to each other are in the same group and um, the points which are not similar lie in different groups. So for the past um, 70 or so years, people have developed different types of clustering methods. The most popular ones are centroid based clustering methods. Um, these include k-means, k doids sparse k-means, and um, there are variants. There are also hierarchical, spectral, density-based methods. Recently, people have used uh, convex clusterings and kernel-based methods, as well as um, model-based and Bayesian approaches. So um, among these um, uh, clustering methods, the most popular ones are centroid-based because they are very fast and uh, they're very interpretable. But um, the centroid-based clustering algorithm fails to um, properly find the cluster structure of microarray data sets, which contains thousands of features, but only a handful of data points. So we are in the uh, regime where P is much, much greater than N. 
And many of these features are redundant in finding the true cluster structure of the data. So um, our job is to uh, mitigate the adverse effect of these features. So we need to somehow filter out these features in order to find a proper cluster structure of the data set. So to do that, people have used something called a feature weight vector. So this is a vector of P dimension where P is the number of features. Um, all of the entries are greater than zero and they sum up to one. And instead of using the standard Euclidean distance, people use something called the weighted distance, which is given by this formula. So the key idea is that if my feature weight is large, it gives more importance towards the difference along that feature. And generally the feature weights are, are a decreasing function of the within cluster sum of squares along that feature. So if my within cluster sum of square along, this, along a particular feature is large, its feature weight is small. So using this feature weights, um, different people have proposed different methods. Um, for example, Huang et al proposed um, weighted canines. And um, Witten and Tripshriani proposed, uh, um, uh, proposed their sparse k-means clustering method, which used these uh, feature weights. However, there's a gap in the literature. Um, first of all, the weighted k-means proposed by Huang et al, um, they failed to select important features in the data because um, there's no um, feature selection procedure going on. It's only a procedure for feature weighting. And uh, the proposal by Witten and Tripshirani, that is computationally expensive because they use a bisection or some root finding algorithm to find a solution um, to the optimization problem. And both of these methods do not come with large sample guarantees, um, which is available for k-means and its variance. So we propose something called the last awaited um, k-means objective function, which is given by this. So um, here we have the within cluster sum of squares, plus we have some additional penalty on the Ws and the penalties are adjusted according to the within cluster sum of squares um, for that corresponding feature. And we have this um, term, which ensures that the feature weights are non-negative. So this optimization problem can be uh, visually represented here for the weighted k-means, the cost contours are like this, and the constraint set is given by this line. And also for sparse k-means, the constraint set is this, and the cost contours are given by these lines. In both the cases, the, the constraint set remain fixed. But in our case, the constraint set actually varies according to the uh, within cluster sum of squares corresponding to that data. So um, corresponding to that feature, sorry. Uh, so this um, uh, simplex essentially changes as uh, the algorithm progresses, um, meaning that we have more flexibility in controlling which feature is important and which is not. And um, so the main idea is that we want to preserve the per complexity of Lloyd schemes, and also we can prove um, strong consistency guarantees under standard uh, data generation, um, standard assumptions on the data generation process. And empirically, we show that this works very well, even in a low signal to noise ratio regime, and also works well in a classical setting. So um, as for performance, we have, um, we run our algorithm and compare against um, different state of the art, art method on different microarray and um, image data set. And we can see that there's a um, improvement in the performance due to this um, flexible simplex um, idea that we use in our paper. And also we, in, in this figure, we plot the uh, feature weights found out by weighted k-means and sparse k-means. So, so we can see that um, essentially um, these two methods don't work in a um, low signal to the noise ratio regime, whereas um, the lasso weighted k-means can um, properly find the feature weights um, uh, in an efficient way. Thank you. So, hi everyone, uh, my name is Sonia, um, and I just recently graduated from Berkeley's um, Data Science Master Program. Um, so today my project um, I'm going to talk about is called Landfill Detection in the Wild. And I did this project with my classmates, Brian, Prakash, Lodi, and Michael. 
So extreme weather events are commonplace nowadays. Climate changes has become our shared reality. Um, so greenhouse gases are intricately linked with the climate change. And the second largest greenhouse, um, greenhouse gas, methane, represents one sixth of all the greenhouse emissions. And methane is 68 times more potent than the largest emission gas carbon dioxide. So landfill and waste can steal a large share of the methane gas, around 16%, and it represents the most actionable options to reduce the methane emissions. A um, major challenge with, um, uh, in the field um, of, uh, is getting accurate estimates of the emissions from those landfills. And this is especially the cases in developing countries. So to tackle, all this pro to tackle this problem, our team I think if we should start with detecting where the landfills are. So our goal is to make it affordable to extract satellite image as if it's doing a sweep across large geographical regions and identify existing landfills within the region. So to do this, we, um, we, we built a machine learning pipeline and with three major steps. So step one, we retrieve the satellite image uh, for uh, as a training data. And step two, we use the model to predict where, uh, whether there is a landfill in the image. And step three, we try to locate the landfills within the image. Since um, so, since there is not there isn't a public uh, available gold, golden data sets for landfill images, so we compiled one ourselves. We found around like um, we found around twenty five hundred landfills around the world, and in which two thousand are in the U.S. and five hundred are in the foreign countries. And landfills is uh, incredibly scarce in the world, so there is a large imbalance of negative space. We try to solve this problem by adding four negative data sets for every one positive data set. So in stage one detections, um, we, uh, we tested with, we tried three pre-chain models, Inception v3, RESTAT5, and VGG16. And the, the best model is Inception v3 um, with, um, after fine tuning the parameters and chain about, uh, around 90 epochs. And we tested our final model on unseen test data sets. And the result looks uh, pretty good. With the positive class, the class with the landfills have a precision of 0 0.78, a recall of 0 0.8, and an F1 score of 0 0.79. And the model has an ROC of 0 0.934. And to our, in our stage two model, um, we try to locate where the landfill is. And for this, we use a YOLO V5. Um, state-of-the-art object detection model for our localization job. So we, we did several iterations using um, trying different model sizes and tuning different parameters. And the best model achieved a 64% of F score and a mean average precision of 0 0.638. Um, and here are, um, are some examples that our model did a um, uh, uh, good job, like which including uh, different kinds of landscapes, including in the forest, in cities, in deserts, our model are able to locate um, the landfills. And also um, uh, there are some image that our um, YOLO V5 didn't do so well, but as you can see in this image that the landfills are blend well into, in the, blend well into in the environment. So it's even hard for our human eyes to differentiate it. So for these cases, we need extra information like the infrared bands um, to further enhance our model performance other than the RGB we are um, only using right now. So we test our localization model on uh, unseen data sets. The performance still pretty okay, having a mean average precision um, of 0.449. Um, so to summarize, um, that's what we, our team built, um, do for this project. We built a data pipeline to uh, extract land, landscape image from the satellite data. We, we labeled our, uh, the data sets and we changed a classification model and a localization model that are fine tuned for the landscape detection. Um, and here are some um, uh, other comments from uh, the field expert. Um, and thank you um, for, and, um, for, the, for the time, thanks. All right. 
Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. I will be presenting an NLP research uh, that my teammates and I did, um, and we called it ESG BERT. Environment, social, and governance, which, are, which I will refer to as ESG, are non-financial factors that are garnering attention from investors as they increasingly look to include these in findings, finding risks and growth opportunities. Some of this attention is also driven by clients who now more aware than ever are demanding for their money to be managed and invested responsibly. As interest in ESG grows, so does the need for investors to have access to consumable ESG information. Since most of it is in text form, we saw an opportunity to apply NLP techniques for classification tasks. In early 1990s, fewer than 20 publicly listed companies had issued reports that included ESG data. That number grew to almost 6,000 by 2014. Regula regulations by the SEC um, also drove these motivations for increased disclosures. Lastly, the advances in NLP, particularly with contextual representations, gave us confidence to pursue our research. Before this advancement, word embeddings did not capture context. And as we have, we've all seen, uh, word meanings can really differ context to context. For example, the meaning of bank differs from the sentence, I am going to open a bank account with I am going for a picnic by the river bank. So we wanted to create embeddings that would have a specific context, one of environment, social, and governance literatures for company, companies. We decided to use publicly disclosed SEC filings from S&P 500 companies to see the progress of environmental activities and investments in those companies through two classification tasks, whether there was a change or not in an environmental score, and whether the change was positive or negative for each company for each quarter. In order to build the context uh, for contextual-based representations for words, we used um, literature from guides, case studies, blogs, reports, and surveys that were available from a project called Accounting for Sustainability. And for our classification task, as inputs, we used the SEC filings, and as outputs, we used environment score for each company for each quarter from an analytical company called Sustainalytics. The basis of our model was BERT. Um, and BERT stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representations from Transformers. Um, I would like to describe it in four main components. A word piece tokenizer that tokenizes each input sentence into words and subwords. A transformer, which is a deep learning model that adopts the mechanism of stealth attention, which differentially weights the significance of each part of the in input data. And two tasks, the one, the mass language modeling task that allows to get the bidirectional part of the learning. Uh, the task randomly masks some of the tokens from the input and predicts the mask words based only on context. Next sentence prediction task that captures the relationship between two sentences that's not directly captured in word level language modeling. So BERT's embeddings are trained over in over more than 3000 million words. Um, and since our, the text in our research is also in English language, we did not, because we were considering only American companies, we did not want to forego the benefit of the pre-trained weights on such a large English corpora. Therefore, we further trained BERT's pre-trained weights using an additional mass language modeling task to be able to learn ESG context specific representations. So far for the process of the research, I've described parts one, two, and three listed here so I'll go from four onwards now. The classification task used publicly disclosed SEC filings, and those contain a lot of information about companies, which is mostly financial. To be able to extract the non-financial information, particularly that relevant to ESG, was another machine learning task. We used an architecture published as Universal Sentence Encoder to encode every sentence in the document for every company for every quarter, and we used a benchmark encoded sentence that contained a lot of environment specific words um, to then be able to use cosine similarity and pick the top three sentences from each document based on their environment relevance. We fine tuned our classification tasks as mentioned earlier and our results were better than both BERT and common class prediction 
Um, I mentioned common class prediction here because it performed better than a lot of uh, other baseline models that we tried like KNN. With our research, we strengthened the confidence in learning that uh, in the learning that context learned domains lo learned do on domain specific corpus can benefit downstream classification tasks for that domain. We anticipate that ESG birds retain weights that have ESG context can be used for specific text classification tasks. Example, predicting social and governance risk scores for companies in addition to the environment risk scores that we predicted. Additionally, the weights can be enhanced uh, by training on additional ESG corpora like ESG disclosures that companies have now started to release. We, we think that these disclosures will fully focus on environment, social and governance practices and investments, and therefore there'll be a, there'll be a lot more context to learn from them. Thank you. Excellent, thanks, Shristi. And next up we have Corinne Elliott. So Corinne, feel free to share your screen. All right, thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Corinne Elliott. I'm a third year PhD student in Berkeley Statistics. I work under Bin Yu, and I'm here to discuss the developing R package on behalf of myself and fellow Berkeley students, James Duncan and Tiffany Tang. Uh, so with that, let's talk about SimChef, an R package for transparent and reliable simulation studies. So R packages are usually inspired by an unmet need. And in our case, we seek improved truth in data science. So here we take a broad definition of data science, meaning investigation of data in an effort to under better understand the natural world. Um, simulation studies have become ubiquitous to the scientific process in general and data science in particular, but published descriptions of simulation experiments tend to be sparser than their empirical counterparts, making them difficult to replicate and also to judge the trustworthiness of. So we need to impose higher standards and quality control efforts to ensure that data science affords both reliable and reproducible conclusions from our data. But how do we characterize a good simulation? Uh, so we propose a handful of criteria on this slide, most of which are fairly intuitive. Um, transparency refers to clear and accurate translation between the scientific question and the simulation scenarios in use, with the latter being enumerated prior to any computation and communicated along with the associated results in an honest and understandable manner. Uh, simulation studies must further capture realistically the phenomena that we seek to understand, which could be as simple as testing methods under both adversarial and, frequent, and friendly scenarios, or could entail designing simulations inspired by real world data. The code should be intuitive to use, should be modular in that we can modify or extend it with ease, and it should be efficient to run. And finally, for trustworthy simulations, they need to be transparent not only in what they do, but reproducible in how they do it to afford consistent and reliable results across computers and research groups who might want to replicate the work. We'd like to think that these criteria are fairly uncontroversial, um, but that doesn't mean they're easy to implement. So using uh, under the belief that widespread adoption of high standards requires easing the burden of meeting those standards, we set out to create the package SimChef, which makes good practice of simulations easier to follow. So with SimChef, we hope to allow data scientists to focus on the substantive questions with fewer technical distractions and thus lower the barrier to high quality simulation studies. And by extension, we'd like to improve the communication of both the simulation processes and the conclusions, uh, which our package accommodates by automating the creation of comprehensive documentation of what was done and what was learned. So I'll end with a brief overview of the key features of the package. Um, as you can see from the code pictured on screen, it employs a straightforward syntax in a grammar reminiscent of the tidyverse, um, which these lines of code specifically define a simulation experiment with a specified data generating process, model, evaluation metric, and visualization, um, each one line of code in turn. We provide a library of helper functions for use in defining these different parts of the experiment the data generating process, the evaluation metrics, and so on. But we also accommodate functions written by the user for use in less common contexts or, or specific needs. 
Um, and finally, if we take note of the final line of code, this create RMD, um, that line of code is in the, the vein of encouraging transparent communication, which automatically visualizes the results as an interactive HTML dashboard. So with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, James and Tiffany, as well as our fabulous advisor, Bin Yu, uh, all of you for your attention, and to invite you to follow the provided link or just search for SimChef on GitHub to explore the package yourself. Um, we're more than happy to hear from anyone with comments or suggestions or even any bugs that you run across since we're in the beta testing phase of this package. So thank you very much. Uh, and by the way, I really love the SimChef um, uh, pa our package. I think it'll be very useful. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, I love to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank, thanks, guys, for uh, introducing that use very useful package. Um, so for today, um, um, I prepared a short presentation on uh, a recent uh, publication and paper that I collaborate with uh, many of my wonderful colleagues. Um, before that, I want to introduce myself. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Yi He. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate at UC Berkeley College of Environmental Design. Uh, and the topic of my talk today is dissecting lightning strike hazard impact patterns to the national airspace system facilities in the contiguous United States. Uh, this is a interdisciplinary collaboration between UC Berkeley, uh, Ressler Polytech Institute, and the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, and the main, the main research question that we're trying to answer is, what are the impact patterns of lightning strike hazard to the facilities in the US airspace system? And my collaborators and I have developed a time series pattern recognition approach to understand the socio-temporal impact patterns of this hazard. Okay, to our knowledge, uh, the lightning strike posed a severe threat to the United States National Airspace System or the NAS. Um, although the US Federal Aviation Administration or FAA for short, um, implements lightning protection practices and procedures to protect the personnel, electronic equipment, and the structures within the NAS, uh, many lightning induced outages still occur. Uh, on this slide, I show the distribution of the lightning strike peak currents based on the National Lightning Detection Network data set over the past 11 years. And we can see that the maximum peak current of lightning strikes can go all the way up to 400 kiloamps. And these exact lightning strikes possess a strong dis uh, disruptive capacity and high hazard potential for, uh, that may cause serious damage to aircraft uh, airports infrastructure and airspace facilities. And this map here shows the kernel density estimation of the lightning induced facility outages in the United States. And we can see that in areas where the maximum peak current of lightning strike is high, um, more outages can occur as well. To further investigate the lightning strike hazard impact pattern, we extracted lightning strike time series that are directly associated with facility outages in the past 11 years for a total of 284 distinct um, airports in the contiguous United States. Then we applied an innovative pattern recognition methods to identify key characteristics of these lightning strike time series. Um, and uh, due to the duration of this presentation, I won't go into the details, but feel free, uh, please feel free to contact me and I'm happy to send you the paper that we um, that has all the details um, inside. Uh, and our results uh, in this study uncover the complexities of lightning strike hazard impact patterns to the NAS facilities, identifying five distinct typologies with climatological uh, signatures critical to creating better hazard mitigation strategies. Basically, the first typology or T1 uh, involves the occurrences of one or more lightning flashes with high peak current with, within five kilometers of the airport. And the second typology T2 can be characterized by higher occurrences of lightning flashes in further distances uh, when we, we observe 10 to 20 kilometers or in some extreme cases, nearly 30 kilometers away from the airport with a very high peak current. And it should be noted that the current lightning protection standards put much focus on protecting facilities that are within 
uh, that are within the, uh, the airport boundary and facilities beyond the network boundary are often neg neglected for lightning hazard assessment. And the existence of this typology uh, sends an important warning signal to both policymakers and airport operators. The third typology, T3, can be uh, summarized by large quantities of lightning flash occurrences, both adjacent and far away from the airport, but with relatively low peak current. And this draws attention to the impact of chronic versus acute stress on the system. And the last two typologies are both related to the temporal pattern of the lightning flash occurrences. And we're surprised to learn that the lightning flashes that took place as early as one hour prior uh, to the time of the outage uh, could induce facility uh, failures. And that, with that uh, summarizes my presentation uh, for today. And uh, I also want to thank my, all my wonderful collaborators, Xiang Yue from ECS Berkeley, uh, Sarah Lindbergh from uh, my home department, CD, Jin Xi Gao from RPI, Chuck Grace from um, FAA, and uh, Professor Jessica Ruskus from uh, Berkeley Engineering. So yeah, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Yi. That was great. And that concludes for now the live talks that we have. So we have three additional ones that I will be um, sharing that are pre recorded. So, hello, everyone. I'm Yi Tong Wang, a PhD candidate in biostatistics. In oh, my apologies. Um, we'll switch up the order here since that's my mistake. We will actually hear first from Yu Tong Wang um, on their presentation. My apologies. Dr. Yun Song's lab. Today, I'm going to talk about our joint integration analysis of paired imaging and genetics data. This is joint work with Dr. Aaron Street's lab. So I know many of you do not work in computational biology, so just to give some background first. In recent years, single cell RNA sequencing has become a powerful approach to detect and quantify the RNA transcripts of individual cells, thus revealing the cellular heterogeneity in multicellular organisms, as shown here. However, single cell RNA sequencing only provides transcriptional profiling and cannot measure morphological features of single cells, which are also very important in establishing cellular functions. Lipid, or say fat, is one of such morphological features. But you might wonder, why should we even care about fat? They are actually very important because they can provide or store energy for different nutritional needs. And without the energy balance, there would be potential risks for obesity or diabetes. So here are two figures, each represents a single adipocyte or say fat cell. The cell on the left, it has many small lipid droplets for accelerated energy dispersal. And the right figure has one single large lipid droplet for energy storage. Each fat cell needs to develop its own lipid storage strategy. For instance, this could be the optimal size or the number of lipid droplets in order to better undergo the metabolic process. So in order to better understand the lipid storage strategy and how genetics regulate it, we need to pair up the RNA sequencing measurements and the imaging data of the same set of cells. In this study, we generated such paired dataset using a novel microfluidic device developed from the streets lab. Great, so now we have the data and then we can actually start to do some very cool data science. Before combining the two modalities, we first asked which feature drives the most variability in each modality. So the gene expression data is very sparse with many zero entries, and it's also high dimensional with thousands of genes as features. Thus, we first extract its latent structure by applying non-active matrix factorization which is able to identify significant genes and further infer enriched biological pathways from these highlighted genes. As you can see on the left, most of the identified pathways, they're indeed highly related to lipid droplets. And for the imaging data, each row in the heat map is an imaging trait feature and each column represents an adipocyte. So we use hierarchical clustering across rows to identify important imaging features and across columns to differentiate cells based on their imaging data. 
cells in the left clusters have a smaller number of large lipid droplets, but cells in the right clusters, they have many small lipid droplets. We group the cells in these two separate clusters for downstream supervised machine learning. The supervised machine learning method that we used is called Iterative Random Forest, or IRF, developed by Dr. Bing Yu's lab. This is essentially just an ensemble of weighted random forests and random intersection trees. The advantage of IRF over other methods is that it can discover high order feature interactions in a very stable and interpretable way with the same order of computational cost as random forests. So the figure on the right shows the area under the precision recall curve. And you can see our trained model performs much better than a random classifier marked in red here across 100 random seeds. And this figure highlights the high order gene interactions uh, that we identified, which are predictive of the morphological features. And potentially they could determine the lipid uh, storage strategies of the edible sites. Okay, so lastly, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, Sebastian in Yuin's lab, Anushka and Rodrigo in Aaron's lab. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, thoughts, or if you're interested in imaging and genetics data. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Navya. I recently graduated from MIDS in December 2021, and I currently work at Ripple as a data scientist. During my time in the MIDS program, I worked on many interesting projects, and the work I'm going to present today is from one of those projects. I'm going to be talking about scaling dataset balancing with smoke using k-means. A balanced data set is one in which all classes have equal or near equal representation. For example, the pie chart on the slide for male and female gender is balanced, but many real life applications such as fraud detection have highly imbalanced data, where hardly 2% of the data contains fraudulent transactions. Why do we need to balance our data set? Well, for starters, running a simple model on the fraud detection data set can give you 98% accuracy by always choosing the majority class, but this would be a false high accuracy. Even if we use a different measure of performance, there is still a major problem of bias. The model will learn features of majority class well at the expense of the minority class. Hence, it is important to have equal representation. The most common techniques for data balancing are undersampling and oversampling. Undersampling includes taking samples of the majority class and downsizing it to be equal to the size of the minority class. Oversampling includes making copies or duplicates of the minority class to make it equal to the size of the majority class. There are many variations of undersampling and oversampling. A very popular and effective oversampling approach is SMOTE, or Synthetic Minority Oversampling Technique, introduced by Chavla et al. in 2002. SMOTE provides a very unique approach to oversampling in which the minority class is oversampled by creating synthetic examples rather than just duplicating the data. On the slide, the red dots represent the minority class. Now we take one such minority sample or red dot and find its nearest neighbor. The blue dotted line represents the path between the sample and its nearest neighbor. We plot a synthetic data point at a random point on the blue dotted line. This is repeated for each minority sample. Depending on the number of synthetic samples you want to generate, we pick the number of nearest neighbors to each point. Let's consider a real life example, the airline delay prediction problem. Anyone who has taken machine learning at scale in MEDS would have worked on this project. 89% of the time, the flight is not delayed. Only 11% of the time, the flight is delayed. Departure delay 30 is the outcome variable. Uh, a flight is considered delayed if the departure delay is greater than 30 minutes. So theoretically, SMOTE would be a great technique to use to balance the classes. However, if you notice closely, the minority class has 2 million records. Why is that a challenge? Well. Implementing SMOTE on the minority class would mean fitting, uh, finding k nearest neighbors for each of the 2 million data points and fitting these 2 million records in memory. This is computationally intractable. 
IMB Learn has an inbuilt library for SMOD, but this uses NumPy arrays, which are very computationally expensive. SMOD can be scaled using K-means algorithm by first splitting the data into clusters and then running SMOD on each cluster independently. The purple dots on the first plot represent the minority class. The minority class is then split into several clusters using the k-means algorithm. And we can decide how many clusters we want based on the size of the data. Then uh, we run SMOT on each cluster independently and finally combine these clusters to form the final oversample data set. Um, the beauty of this process is that the clusters can generate the synthetic data in parallel and don't need to, the clusters don't depend on each other. This greatly reduces the processing time. So for the data set I showed earlier, I first divided the minority class into 1000 clusters and then ran SMOT using seven nearest neighbors to generate the synthetic data. This result in a balanced data set that took about two and a half hours to process versus 24 plus hours using the original SMOT algorithm before giving me an out of memory error. So in conclusion, SMOT using k-means is a scalable solution to balancing large data sets by generating synthetic samples. This approach increases speed and efficiency by processing each cluster parallelly, and it can be used in many real world applications like rare disease detection. For next steps, I'd like to work on improving clustering through more hyperparameter tuning and experimenting more to find the optimal number of clusters based on the size of the data set. Thanks so much for listening. I'd love to take any questions.